Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar a year after the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, Now What? I'm Crystal Giesbrecht, and I'm a member of Regina's Amnesty International Group. On behalf of Amnesty International Regina, we want to thank you very much for joining us and acknowledge that we are on Treaty 4 territory. This territory is the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Nakoda, Dakota, Lakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. For those of you participating in the Zoom webinar, we'll ask you to please keep your camera off and your microphone on mute. This webinar is being recorded and we're also live on Facebook right now. The topic of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is one that Amnesty members care deeply about and we're so thankful to have Dr. Brenda Anderson and Judy Hughes here to talk to us about recent developments and discuss what happens next. I will very quickly introduce both Brenda and Judy. If you were logged on early you may have had the chance to see their bios on the screen before we got started. If not, you can see the full biographies for both speakers posted on amnestysaskatchewan.ca. Our first speaker this evening is Dr. Brenda Anderson, Associate Professor in the Department of Gender, Religion and Critical Studies at Luther College at the University of Regina. One of Dr. Anderson's major research areas is missing and murdered Indigenous women. In 2010, after organizing an international conference on violence against Indigenous women, Dr. Anderson co-edited the book, Torn from Our Midst. A second book, Global Femicide, is forthcoming. During this webinar, she will contextualize the recent national inquiry within the Canadian landscape and within the larger global phenomenon of femicide. Following Brenda, we will hear from Judy Hughes. Judy has over 30 years of experience and has provided leadership for the Native Women's Association of Canada, as well as the Saskatchewan Aboriginal Women's Circle Corporation, where she currently serves as president. She is a community representative on the Provincial Partnership for Missing Persons and an executive member of Saskatchewan Sisters in Spirit. Judy has received both the Saskatchewan Centennial Leadership Medal and the Commemorative Medal for the Centennial of Saskatchewan, recognizing her significant contributions to our province. If you have questions for our speakers, you can enter them in the chat. If you are on Zoom, you can send them to everyone or you can send them in a private message to myself or David Wessel. And if you're watching live on Facebook, you can comment there. At the end of Brenda and Judy's presentation, I will direct as many questions as we have time for to our speakers. During the webinar, you'll also hear about resources that you can follow up and do more reading later, and the speaker slides will be made available. Hi everyone. I hope you all can see me and can see my PowerPoint presentation coming up here. Pauline is getting that going. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I live on and uh, am sustained by Treaty 4 land. And I ask that we be mindful of the ways that we can all be in restorative community together as treaty people. I come from a European Canadian settler background, so I speak from that perspective. I was taught a history that erased Indigenous realities of the present and it relegated uh, Indigenous people to some sort of mythic past. So for many of us perhaps tonight who come from that settler history, we've had to relearn uh, what we were taught from our Indigenous friends and scholars. And that starts with that understanding that we grow up on Treaty 4 land. I want to thank Amnesty International for asking me to speak this evening. I always respond to their requests if I can because they've done such important work. And just want to acknowledge Crystal Giesbrecht, Gordon Barnes, David Wessel and Paulina who is behind the scenes tonight doing the technical piece here. I uh, really appreciate that. And especially a thank you to my cohort this evening, Judy, a person I really listen to when she speaks. I want to thank everybody else for joining us and I do want to acknowledge that there will be family members joining us this evening as well. 
So I've been asked to give an overview of the final report of the National Inquiry and give some context about its recommendations. And of course, as Crystal said, this is available to you afterwards um, because there are a lot of important links and resources for your own activism. And then Judy's going to talk about what's happened since that inquiry was delivered. The report was delivered in June of 2019. I start tonight with this very hopeful uh, quote from one of the inquiry commissioners, Marion Buller, because for me, there has to be that ideal to work towards. The quote doesn't reflect the present, but it must reflect a future. Canada will be a great country as long as it has an open mind, an open heart, and an open spirit. I'm going to be relying on some of the information that's on the website for the final inquiry and you'll see that link uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, right now I just want to make sure we're all online with what the inquiry was about so I'm just going to read from this slide to begin with. The National Inquiry's final report reveals that persistent and deliberate human and Indigenous rights violations and abuses are the root cause behind Canada's staggering rates of violence against Indigenous women, girls, and two SLGBTQQIA people. The two-volume report calls for transformative legal and social changes to resolve the crisis that has devastated Indigenous communities across the country. It is comprised of truths from more than 2,380 family members, survivors of violence, experts and knowledge keepers who shared over two years of cross-country public hearings and evidence gathering. It delivers 231 individual calls for justice directed at governments, institutions, social service providers, industries, and in fact, to all Canadians. Testimony from family members and survivors of violence spoke about the surrounding context marked by multi-generational and intergenerational trauma and marginalization in the form of poverty, insecure housing or homelessness, and barriers to education, employment, healthcare, and cultural support. Experts and knowledge keepers spoke to specific colonial and patriarchal policies that displaced women from their traditional roles in communities and governance and diminished their status in society, leaving them vulnerable to violence. So this is a huge task and the inquiry itself was met with really differing emotions. Many welcomed it as a strong step forward. There is a sense that the report provides an anchor or a common language. It established some key research and a framework from which to move forward, um, much as the Truth and Reconciliation's work has given us. These 231 calls for justice, they really resemble, and of course they intersect with the TRC's 94 calls to action. Others saw the inquiry as work that had already been done. The 2004 Amnesty International um, Stolen Sisters Report, the 2007 United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the repeated calls to Canada to address the issue, the work of so many national Indigenous leaders and family members, the two Sisters in Spirit reports, these really fell on deaf ears with the Conservative Party under the leadership of Stephen Harper. The 2008 report, The Voices of Our Sisters in Spirit, it provided the stories from over 500 families that established these same links to colonial practices and institutions. And then the 2010 report, What Their Stories Tell Us, provided specific policy changes that we would do well to revisit. And they're what has been updated and expanded upon in um, the final inquiry. You'll see the second point here on the slide. One of the election promises of our Liberal Party today under the leadership of Trudeau was to form the National Inquiry. They uh, successfully were elected in 2015 and that was quickly followed by a pre-inquiry process. The National Inquiry that worked between 2016 to 19 and the presentation on June 3rd of 2019 was the uh, report Reclaiming Power and Place, the report that we're working from this evening. The next slide. 
during the inquiry process, there was great concern and there was considerable pain from some of the families who were invited to share their stories. There was concern over who was and who was not chosen to speak. And there was a lot of concern over what support was offered after the testimonials to the families who had traveled to give their stories. Uh, there were commissioners who resigned during the process, others stayed, and the media followed very different viewpoints of people involved in the inquiry. So there's a lot of frustration and tension visited that's part of this whole process. The fact remains that the work that was accomplished under a very unreasonable timeline and with limited resources does pinpoint why being an Indigenous, Indigenous woman makes you five times more likely to be targeted for violence. This report and the amount of resources that in it, that's in it give us a really sophisticated and intersectional Indigenous analysis and it's laid alongside specific calls from Indigenous women and girls so these are things that then we can use in our own communities and I feel that it has given us a cultural shift that that is that is building so I see where this can take us if we have the will but of course we need to be holding uh, one another accountable in this process. I have a, a clip here it's the second one on the screen and this um, as Pauline puts it on this is coming straight from the um, this is coming from the uh, website uh, the on the final report. So if uh, Paulina, if you can start that. This gives you an idea of the resources that you could use as well. Importantly, I think it gives us a framework to begin to analyze Canada's obligations, but also to begin to identify various inequalities and vulnerabilities. It can be used to redress power discriminatory practices and address some of the unjust distributions of power and begin to identify some of Canada's actions that undercut human rights. Uh, the next reason that I think a human rights-based approach is appropriate is because of the way in which it keeps Indigenous women's needs at the centre and at the focus of the work. It does this in part by acknowledging Indigenous women and girls as rights holders. It promotes their agency and autonomy and allows for uh, the process to consider the various different contexts and different ways in which women experience discrimination, all along with the goal of increasing the safety, protection and empowerment of Indigenous women. So the, if we can go back to the PowerPoint as well. Um, these, that's an example of uh, the types of um, resources that are available. Um, and I could see these kinds of clips being used um, in classrooms or businesses or organizations that uh, want to begin to understand the complexity of colonialism and where they fit in, what they can uh, redress in their own, uh, in your own lives. So that, uh, this at the top of the uh, PowerPoint is the uh, video, or sorry, is the link to the website. I've listed a few that I find uh, really compelling. Um, Pauline is going to show uh, three of these uh, right now and just want you to get the perspective of what's being addressed and what we need to consider in this, in this work.
And she would have been a child when she met John Smith. Of course, in the movie, she's betrayed as a young woman. Uh, she's betrayed um, scantily clad uh, for most of the uh, film. And the disconnect, I think, is both evidence of that overall in the media, but in particular when it comes to the portrayal of indigenous women, it's that over-sexualization, even at a young age, uh, the, the, the maturation, thinking that indigenous women are somehow sexually um, active or mature at, an, at a very young age compared to the regular population and always positioning them, them in sexual positions. And it's not just with Pocahontas, even movies that are made ostensibly about murdered and missing indigenous women. There was a movie a couple of years ago called Wind River out of the US um, where the role for the indigenous women in the movies was essentially as rape victim. They they were not active participants in the other narrative. This was also true of the uh, Oscar-winning film The Revenant from a few years ago, where Indigenous women, their entirety in that film was as victims and as sexual objects, and where rape was used as a plot device as opposed to central to the telling of the story. Uh, and that dehumanization and that sexualization contributes to the fact that, you know, today Indigenous women are the most marginalized community on Turtle Island, and the most at-risk uh, community just by the nature of their identity. And I think this contributes to um, pol public policy as well as uh, the legal system and its approach to these uh, issues. I think it is important to look at gender-based violence. I know that there was a, a big push coming from um, some Indigenous men that this inquiry include men and boys. And when you look at the, the murders and disappearances of Indigenous men, it's very different. The dynamic is very different. They are not being murdered because they're men. And for Indigenous women, we are very much targeted. Um, we're targeted because of um, all of the things that the law has done to us through the Indian Act and all of the things that the church has done to us um, to position us in the places that we're at now with such marginalized status. Sorry, I got lost for the last okay. video, I'm sorry. That's okay, you're doing great. I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> Thank you, I'm so you sorry. It was very prepared, but sometimes it doesn't happen like once, once. <laughs> exactly. Here we go. Okay. I think it, it is okay now. I think that's a fundamental question to ask. A lot of people think that we need to find new answers to remedy some of the most uh, pressing problems confronting First Nations children in care and their families. 
I argue against that. I think that actually we have known for or at least 111 years the inequalities that have been facing these communities and how that has piled up on the hopes and dreams of children and in fact incentivized their removal from children from their families. Uh, first in residential schools, then through the 60s scoop, now in contemporary times. Our problem has not been not having the answers. Our problem has been acting on the answers we already know. And in particular, that falls with the governments. Um, we can go through a series of reports, and I suspect we will, uh, that document the same recommendations over and over and over again. Eradicate the inequalities in housing. Make sure kids have safe housing. Make sure kids are not growing up in poverty. Um, address mental health and substance misuse services and focus on domestic violence. We did those four things and we equalized the services in funding for education, early childhood, cultural services, recreation, things like just a safe place to play. And we could see this turnaround very quickly. If we don't, then I fear we will have another inquiry just like this one. Thanks, Paulina. So there's ever so many more uh, little video clips of people who uh, gave testimony uh, at the inquiry. And these, I think, are a living, uh, uh, a living example um, of what we need to uh, look at and why it's so complex. Um, understanding that uh, is the first step, but then as Cindy just said, if we aren't going to provide the answers and resolutions to this, we're going to have another inquiry and another and another, and that's the last thing that anybody wants. Um, I want to turn now to the next slide and talk about a couple of term, terminology, some terms that uh, I think we have to come to think about in, in the Canadian context. The inquiry gave, again, this common language, uh, and it connects us to what's happening across the globe in countries that have been colonized and what has happened to Indigenous women specifically. So it's part of the past, but it's also part of the uh, ongoing systems of governance and law and education and healthcare and so on. We maybe can talk fairly easily with the words genocide and femicide when we talk about other countries. But it's, it's often less clear to Canadians that that is part of our identity as well. So the commissioners of the inquiry released a supplementary report called a legal analysis of genocide at the same time as the report. And you may have seen some of the media attention that that got and politicians as well. Um, they latched on to questioning the usage of the term and, and it was really a, a quite a diversion to what was being discussed and needs to be focused on. And it, it felt like Indigenous women's and girls' voices were going to get lost on the sidelines again in, in this discourse. But um, I, I wanted to bring us specifically to these words tonight. They, in the inquiry, the commissioners explained really carefully why they use the term genocide, and the website goes into that, but I wanted to give you just a quote from, from what they said, what the definition of genocide is, and, and you'll see that this was a, a, a definition that was created after, or sorry, just before World War II by a Polish Jewish scholar, Raphael Lemkin, and the definition has been used since then, so um, think about our Canadian context when I read this. Generally speaking, genocide does not necessarily mean the destruction of a nation, except when accomplished by mass killings of all members of a nation. It is intended rather to signify a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of the life of national groups with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. The objectives of a plan of genocide would include actions aimed at the disintegration of the political and social institutions of culture, language, national feelings, religion, and the economic existence of national groups, and the destruction of the personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even the lives of the individuals belonging to such groups. We could get into a lot of details of how we ha are trying to rectify that and what's been in the news um, in the recent days. 
genocide fits our country. Femicide is another word that is perhaps less familiar, but I think it is equally applicable to this issue. This word is used inter internationally to apply specifically to women who are targeted for murder because of their gender. The first report from the Canadian Femicide Observatory for Justice and Accountability. Did you know we had such a thing? I'll just read that again. The Canadian Femicide Observatory for Justice and Accountability. They confirm that the term femicide is every bit as applicable to Canada, where being female and being an Indigenous female makes you vulnerable to violence. They wrote, Indigenous women and girls were overrepresented as victims, comprising about 5% of the population in Canada, but 36% of those women and girls were killed by violence. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women stated that Indigenous women face marginalization, exclusion and poverty because of institutional, systemic, multiple intersecting forms of discrimination. So while we may speak of femicide in Mexico or Guatemala, we need to include uh, this in our Canadian uh, grammar as well. I think we have to remember that sexualized and racialized violence isn't only a product of colonization, but it continues to be used as a deliberate tool of colonization. And that's perhaps one of the most difficult things for Canadians to wrap our heads around. In the inquiry, there were 231 calls to justice. This is where the action begins. These are not recommendations, they're calls to justice. They are, in the language of the report, legal imperatives. There's no luxury of choice here. They're not mincing words. They note that there are four pathways to this justice. To recognize and redress historical, multi-generational, intergenerational trauma. Acknowledge and redress social and economic marginalization. Identify and redress the maintenance of the status quo and institutional lack of caring and be guided by the agency and expertise of Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited LGBTQQIA people. You'll note this comes from the executive summary, which is a really useful resource uh, because it, it does comprise, does encompass the, the learnings of the, um, of the inquiry. Um, they also say our calls to justice aren't just about institutions and governments, although they have foundational obligations to uphold, there is a role for everyone in the short and the long term. Individuals, institutions and governments need to all play a part. So I just want to go through a few other slides, three or four more slides fairly quickly, if we can go to the next slide. I just want to read through them fairly quickly. Um, as examples of where we can draw our attention uh, to make sure that the recommendations are, are um, uh, upheld. Can we go to the next slide, Paulina? Thank you. So these are some suggestions. If we'll get back to the right one. That one, there we go. Um, I think the suggestion is to pick one or two areas to focus on, um, perhaps those with special relevancy to where you live or to people that you know. It's uh, about getting educated for sure, um, but many people are on that path already. Um, Allying yourself with Indigenous groups if you're not Indigenous yourself, and, and Judy's going to talk about SOC uh, in a few minutes. Um, there's many other uh, opportunities, but uh, if we go to the next slide, um, I think it's important uh, to think about the kind of opposition that you might face, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. We can spout all the facts and statistics and language and phrases, and those are good. Um, it's good to have a few in the back of your pocket. Uh, you need to know where to go for further information when people uh, ask you, and so that's why I focused on the inquiry and the and the website. Um, so it's part of the, the your mind, your education, but it's also about being able to build 
your own capacity of decolonizing. This is a word that is maybe contentious for some, but I think it is about listening and learning uh, from Indigenous uh, traditions and people in your neighborhood. Um, that starts to open your heart uh, as well as your mind. Uh, we also use the word indigenization in different uh, areas and aspects. I'm at the university and now indigenization is the word that's being used. To me, it simply means that we are guided by a notion that power is not some sum total in a basket. Um, it's not something that we give to somebody else. Everybody has the right to that power. And if people are, are using their own agency and power, that doesn't take away from mine. Um, we often, as non-Indigenous people, I think often see somehow that we're not going to benefit or power is going to be taken away. Um, so we see this as something uh, dangerous. We don't often think about the gifts that are waiting for us and the knowledge that we quite desperately need and that this will build our, our nation, this will build us as people. Um, so indigenization uh, has some soul searching in, involved in it as well. That's to me is part of activism. Um, sometimes some of the very simple things um, are to learn about ceremonies and to be open if, if uh, people are invited uh, to uh, participate. Uh, just an example on the right hand side is it comes from Toronto, smudge don't judge, being innovative, having humor, uh, and um, looking for opportunities to um, begin to learn in partnership with Indigenous people. And I am speaking as a non-Indigenous person to the, to the non-Indigenous people in the audience right now, and she will speak to, to all of us as well. But I just, I think that that's a really important part of what the inquiry is doing until, until we care frankly, um, we're going to still keep out churning out inquiries and that's not what we want to do. The next slide, please. <clears throat> this is the last one. These, uh, really the two key points is to focus on the relationships. Relationships take time, friendships and trust and uh, your actions showing where your heart is. Um, that's what really this is about. And that takes a long time. So this isn't an overnight piece. Um, we have to rely on the leadership and voices of Indigenous women. Non-Indigenous people have um, thought at one point that residential schools were a good thing, right? And so we don't want to replicate this. The leadership has to come from Indigenous women and men. These are the mottos that I try to live by. Um, I want to learn how to stand uh, alongside and not speak for other people um, and make space for change to happen. So with that, I'm going to uh, conclude my part of this talk and, uh, and leave this to Judy now. Thank you. Okay, Judy, you can go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, there's just a line across the thing. I just wonder where to go. Good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us uh, to uh, talk about this very uh, important and sensitive topic. 
I'd like to acknowledge the Treaty 4 land that I'm on and of course the homeland of the Métis. And I would also like to um, say welcome and hello to any of the families and elders and everyone else uh, who is with us as, as allies in, in this, uh, in this um, works, work towards ending the violence against Indigenous women and girls. Next slide. Okay, just wanted to tell uh, people a little bit about Saskatchewan Aboriginal Women's Circle Corporation because we are a voluntary nonprofit organization and we don't have a lot of funds to be out there doing communications and in the media, but we have done several different things in, in terms of education advocacy, um, research and economic opportunities and, um, and also in engaging in the work and policy and legislative changes that we do at all, <clears throat> excuse me, at all levels of, of government, including Indigenous governments, because we have to, uh, my, my view is that we also have to work with our Indigenous governments if we want some, some change to happen as well. Um, for those who aren't aware, we are the Saskatchewan Provincial Territorial Member Association of the Native Women's Association of Canada. And so ANWAC is comprised of of uh, 13 uh, membership associations. So NWAC does have uh, a PTMA in every province and territory of uh, Canada. So it's the largest, widest region reaching Indigenous organization and Indigenous women's organization in all of Canada because of, of having uh, that outreach to all provinces and territories. And one of, and our uh, membership and constituency encompasses all nations, inclusive of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, non-status, disenfranchised, and 2SLGBTQIA individuals. And I say membership and constituents because you do not have to be a member to access any uh, service or program that, that we provide. And we're one of the, and I said 12 PTMAs because at the time there was only 12 PTMAs at the time that NWAC signed the uh, accord with the Government of Canada on February 1st, 2019. And I'll explain a little bit more of that as we go along. Next slide, please. Okay, so in regards to uh, this particular uh, topic that, that we're discussing, I thought also to give a little bit of background in terms of the the outreach that the um, National Inquiry had. And so just some fast facts that there's 2,386 2, people uh, who participated in the truth gathering process. 1,484 family members and survivors provided testimony. 819 individuals shared through artistic expression and 83 through experts, knowledge keepers, and officials providing testimony, 15 community hearings, nine knowledge keepers, experts, and in institutional hearings. And I put the question at the bottom, how many did not get to tell their truth or share their truth? Because I, I know as an advocate, a non-legal advocate throughout the whole process, there were several uh, people who could not make it due to the fact that they didn't have the means to do it and uh, part of the difficulty with the inquiry was that you had to use the money out of your own pocket and then be reimbursed and that just wasn't wasn't um, a part of the the way that it works uh, with us as indigenous people and in indigenous communities and also um, because of uh, people um, who had a very hard time even knowing about the inquiry until it was almost over. So I would say that we could have even probably doubled the amount of participants that, that took part. Next slide, please. So some of, the, some of our participation as a provincial organization, our priority of course was supporting the families. And in regards to that, it was through the whole thing, through the pre-inquiry design of the inquiry uh, before it even started, uh, the information sessions that happened, 
the health and legal preparation for families, which was very um, crucial, but it was also very, um, I think in terms of some, some of the words that the families used, it was very grueling for them, the number of steps that they had to take to even uh, sign up to give their, their story. Um, and then we also took part in, in the three areas of the uh, National Inquiry, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, so we also participated in helping families prepare their stories. We delivered uh, training on grief, trauma, and ambiguous loss with frontline workers. It's one with frontline workers and also a separate one also for the families. Um, um, then as SOC being a part of a six member team of indigenous organizations across uh, Saskatchewan, uh, uh, Federation of Saskatchewan, well, sorry, <laughs> the old name, the um, Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, uh, Regina Treaty Status Indians, the Family Information uh, Liaison Unit, Iskwewik, and uh, PA uh, Prince Albert Grand Council. So we, were, we all had our teleconferences together, so that's how Saskatchewan was organized. And then part of the other thing that SOC does is, is we were hosting the, the four ceremonial feasts and our fourth and final feast will be in, uh, on December the 5th in Yorkton. And it's going to be both virtual and kind of in person, uh, which we've actually worked out uh, so that um, we could do, do some things in person. So if people want to know more about that, they can certainly uh, con contact us in that regard. Next slide, please. Okay, so then also we had the opportunity uh, to participate as a non-legal advocate. And what that meant was that uh, SOC re received a contribution agreement from the National Inquiry uh, so that we could participate in the hearings that the families went to the I'm going to have to go back. <laughs> uh, ones that the families went to, then also the uh, um, expert hearings and also the institutional hearings. So what that meant is that we were able to hire a lawyer to act as our legal counsel at the hearings effective September 2018 to December 2019. And uh, we participated in some of the hearings by attending and bearing witness to the testimonies and we also attended some of the expert hearings and institutional hearings. But again, um, because we had to put the money up front and then be reimbursed, um, we weren't able to participate as fully as some organizations could that have the money or were more, in fact, more effective in terms of, of being able to access funds from, uh, from some other places. So we did put in our oral submission and our lawyer at the time uh, presented our oral submission on recommendations uh, to the inquir inquiry in October or uh, November of 2019. And then we did a written submission on the recommendations to the National Inquiry. And even though we signed our agreement back in April of 2017, the only ones that have been paid so far is the lawyers. So there's still outstanding of, of almost $200,000 to a sock and other people that put in their personal money so that we could participate in in the uh, national inquiry and the same thing happened to anwac they just received some money about two months ago from uh at the very end of the inquiry and i don't know if other organizations had that problem but we, we certainly did next slide please Okay, so now to talk a little bit about um, the reaction to the inaction. And um, we, I guess I knew well enough in advance as did a number of other organizations that the National Action Plan wasn't going to be produced. And part of the reasons is that is because there was not too much happening over the time frame, and uh, and then just at the very end, um, you know, although ANWAC had a national roundtable in January and other organizations were putting together 
uh, some of their national action plan pieces, uh, there, there wasn't any movement from the federal government in, in that regard. And uh, I think people heard so many different ways, but to me it was just indescribably unacceptable to not have that national action plan. And although the government tried to use COVID-19 as an excuse, um, for those of us that had to write reports, that had to finish up our projects for the government, we never got any reprieve on that. We had to have everything in on time, et cetera. And uh, um, I'm just saying that they, they could have done better. They had lots of opportunity to, uh, to do that. And it just wasn't a priority for uh, Minister Bennett's office at that particular time. And uh, then in terms of of, uh, I should, wanted to share that quote from uh, Marion Buller, the former head commissioner from the National Inquiry. And she has also been very much out um, in the uh, news, letting, you know, trying also to hold the, the government to task in terms of, of getting this done. And now I know there are a few little uh, calls going on, but like they have like 200, 300 people on the calls and uh, you get no time to talk or give questions. It's just the presentation on, on one or two uh, organizations and what they're doing, which is things that we've actually been doing for, for uh, a number of years. And so I hope that the minister doesn't plan to try to get us all together and continue these um, Zoom meetings or whatever, and just hold it up. And then when there's still no action plan, trying to blame it on, on us as uh, community groups because we haven't got it done yet. Because you know when you've got that many groups together, um, it's gonna be pretty hard to work on a plan if there's no leadership from uh, the federal government or our own leaders. So a couple of things in terms of the um, in action too was a response that that ANWAC had in in regards to their famous uh, report cards and i do have to admit that we did have pressure to not be critical of minister bennett's office to not be critical of the federal government but of course you know we're just going to do the opposite uh, we're going to do what we always do in in terms of of what our members and constituents want and i think in terms of of uh most people that that deal with this issue that we want to have a fair and honest review of of what happened and then again do what we need to do uh, so go to the next slide so in terms of responding to the 231 imperatives as opposed to calling them calls to justice uh, because these are critical um items that need to that need to be done and um, and I just want to let people know that the you're, it's easy to get a hold of the report card, and any report that I'm talking about is on the NWAC site, or I've got them. So if you want to read them in in whole, because this is a, a very short time frame, so I'm just highlighting a certain points. And and I think the very important thing that uh, you know President uh, Whitman had said is that the absence of a national action plan gives us no indication of how Canada intends to respond to the 231 imperatives. And that is so true because even us as Indigenous organizations at the provincial and national levels as advocates, we are getting very little information in terms of, of what's going to happen other than these, these uh, small little groups, um, meetings happening and um, I'm just wondering how she plans to split split us up because that's kind of like the idea that I'm getting from my years in, in politics that it looks like, oh, maybe she'll have, you know, who knows, four or five, six or seven streams for everybody to work in little groups and, and then try to manage the groups. Um, I hope that doesn't happen because uh, to me it's going to I think take take things longer and trying to get the onus off the government in what their responsibilities are. So of course, the, the, 
Brenda did uh, uh, mention the four of the areas. So the first one under the, as put out in the um, report was the right to culture. And again, cultural rights are inseparable from human rights and indigenous rights. And a lot of these, like these four areas that I talk about here are also supported by the United Nations reports and especially was that have come to, that have done reports in regards to Canada, that have done reports in, in response to the National Inquiry final report as well. And uh, if I don't have it in some other place, because I might not have had it in there, but there will be an expert panel um, to that is going to be looking at uh, uh, the expert panel of international experts um, looking at the report in terms of the definition of genocide and the report that um, Fanny wrote about it and uh, and ANWAC will be taking part in in that. I'm not uh, sure in terms of how other than organizing and really pressuring to get this expert panel in because the federal government has to agree for the expert panel to go ahead before it can go ahead. So that is one action that that all of us on this um, uh, webinar can can do is is ensure that we try to get this expert panel in so that um, the, our our federal government knows that they have to be responsible and take some action in terms of of uh, the situation that we're in right now. So in terms of the right to right to culture and and the if anyone had read the report card, of course, it was a resounding fail for, for the federal government in terms of, of this, and primarily because the National Action Plan didn't get done, which was a promise that they made back in 2015. So they not only had one year after the report was done, but they had four years prior to that to, to do that. And I know a number of people that are on the call actively were working on that National Action Plan to end violence against Indigenous women and, and girls many, many more years ago. And, and like for me, it's still now 45 years later and we're still working on the same issues. So we got to get some work done. So in terms of the right to culture, the reason that they got the fail from NWAC for that was because Canada failed to recognize the critical role that Indigenous women do with language in terms of teaching their children to speak the language. And there's no culturally relevant gender-based analysis um, in any of the work and particularly in the Language Act and, and specifically um, primarily Indigenous women were left out of the discussions and engagement sessions on the Indigenous Language Act. And then for the right to health, a lot of it was because Canada's failure to ensure access to clean water and a healthy environment. There's still inadequate housing, food insecurity, and, and just still as late as uh, 2018 forced and coerced sterilization for um, Indigenous women and there is a class action um, coming up and there's for forced and coerced sterilization so I uh, sorry for not giving trigger warnings to people but if that did happen to uh, to you uh, you know let us know because uh, there is a class action and there is is help for people um, who want to know more about uh, writing that wrong. Next slide, please. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Hi, Judy, just give me one second, please. Okay. So anyways, while you're looking for the slide, I've got my paper here. So, so the next one is the right to security. And in, in terms of the, the government of Canada has five key aspects that, that they have in terms of what they regard the security of Indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse people. And that of course is health, housing, access to water and food, employment and livelihood and education. And in, in all of those areas, a fail from NWAC because there's so many gaps still in the health services. People are still fighting over Jordan's principle like our children are not getting the proper health care services the child welfare act is a mess uh, there's overcrowding or lack of housing 
We still have 61 royal advisories across Canada, poverty in their high unemployment, and education and, and lack of access to the education. And so there are some things going, going on, but in terms of, of where we should be at in 2020 is quite, quite a few digits lower than where, where non-Indigenous people are. And then the right to justice and um, not even mentioning the brutal attacks by police all across the country and across the world, it seems. Um, it just the gap in the delivery of justice in practice and theory over incarceration of Indigenous women, increased violence in the home, shelters and policing. And I know one of the um, viewers was asking, you know, were the five shelters being built? And I understand that some are started, like one or two are starting to be built, but uh, all five of them are not built at this particular point in time. And the full report card can be found at the NWAC website that's noted on there. Next slide, please. Okay. And um, so then there is um, there is some participation points that we want to work on. So uh, for a SOC and and being part of NWAC, as we all work together with our thirteen uh, PTMAs plus. Uh, several other organizations and individuals. So anyone can, can work with us. So if you feel that you want to join us in, in any of the actions that we're taking or recommend some other actions that we can help you that you want to work on, um, please feel free to give me uh, a call or contact me in, in some way and uh, we can work together on that. So what we've presented to Carolyn Bennett and to Minister Carolyn Bennett um, the Crown and Indigenous uh, Affairs is in terms of of what we wanted to be the next meeting step of course was to hand down you know the National Action Plan on June the 3rd like you promised but of course that didn't happen then the National Task Force like this is something that um, that we've been asking for for a number of years is to um, how the National Task Force, uh, comprised of all the people that we feel need to be, be there to review um, and to reinvestigate all of the cases and all of the unsolved files of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and 2SLGBTQQIA people from across Canada. And one thing that we're finding too at our office, uh, at our provincial office here, is that we are having Indigenous people phoning and saying that they want their other cases to be looked at. Now, some cases have been closed and ruled suicide, um, but then people want to, you know, because they and also the community feel that that was not the case, to have another look at it and to see um, if there's anything further that uh, that got missed, you know, that can be looked at in terms to actually determine because it's very important for those families to um, know the truth like what actually did happen uh, so those are very that's very important and you'll notice on here when i'm talking about the uh, points it does also give the the call for justice number if you have the the book or the ubs um, that's where that's where you'll find these things now the the next slide please now the resiliency healing lodge this is uh one of the things like this this has been the loudest um request uh, from from families and people who support families across the country in terms of needing to have more support for grief and trauma, um, suicide, ambiguous loss, um, some form of healing, some form of uh, commemoration, some place to have a spot where, where they can be privately with their missing or murdered loved one. And uh, so one of these things that happened is a Res Resiliency Healing Lodge. 
And so back in, it's been a discussion with NWAC for a while. So at the 2019 NWAC Annual General Assembly, SOC put forward a, a resolution on the floor that NWAC not only build or develop their own healing lodge, resiliency healing lodge, but also help all the provinces and territories that wish to have a resiliency lodge, um, that they find a way to make that happen. So what has happened since that time, and this is largely due to the chief executive officer, uh, Lynn Grew, who has worked night and day on, on several of these uh, initiatives, um, that ANWAC now does have a Resiliency Healing Lodge. It was to open on June the 3rd, uh, but with, with uh, COVID-19 um, and the pandemic, it didn't get to happen yet, uh, but it will be very soon. There's going to be a major announcement regarding the virtual opening of its first Resiliency Lodge on the land for all Indigenous women. And uh, the announcement will include a virtual unveiling of the lodge. So everything that it has there, the medicine path, the, the healing rooms, the uh, beading rooms, the uh, craft rooms, commercial kitchen, uh, medicine baths, um, everything like that, uh, that shows evenly a First Nations Métis and and Inuit, and, uh, and there will also be the unveiling of a commemorative art piece in the medicinal garden, and that's paid for by private donations. And the Resiliency Lodge is the first of its kind in Canada, and it also will be operating as a best practice for Canada moving forward following the National Inquiry and the calls for justice. And so those uh, meet all the justice, uh, justice for health Calls for Justice for Health and Wellness Services and the, and the call members there. And the other thing so far, um, so I think there has uh, been five of the PTMAs that have asked ANWAC for help. And so one of them, uh, New Brunswick, um, and they already have their contribution agreement from their provincial government. And it was important to open, um, other than the ANWAC one, where are open close to the national capital, um, and it's a land-based uh, center or lodge. The one in New Brunswick is also land-based, and because it's in the east, it'll be the first to open, as we always work from the eastern door. And then for Saskatchewan, um, we are in the process of working with uh, the infrastructure uh, people at the provincial government in Sis of Saskatchewan here, and we do have a, a site uh, picked out and they do have our um, concept of what our healing lodge will look like. And uh, we're just waiting now to hear in terms of what other steps and hoops we have to go through and hopefully that uh, our um, proposal will be accepted to have one in, in Saskatchewan. And the land that we, uh, selected is just uh, outside of Regina and we'll be able to provide more information once we know that it's actually going to happen. Um, so one of the other uh, things like for the national database, so it's the next slide, and uh, ANWAC did have a national database that they started and that's where we started with the 582 and then got well over 1200 um, names on, on the list. And then funding stopped in 2010. And that was because um, actually Pri uh, Prime Minister Harper at the time got embarrassed at the United Nations because he was questioned on, on the, the uh, crisis of Indigenous women in Canada being murdered and missing. And so after that, he forbade NWAC to even use Sisters in Spirit. And he wouldn't let us call any program Sisters in Spirit. Um, but we still do it because, of course, we don't let the government shut our mouth. If, if uh, we allowed that, nobody would be saying everything. Amnesty International wouldn't even be doing this, although they don't have to listen to our federal government anyway. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. Um, uh, so we're still trying to uh, get that back again. We have uh, for SOC 
we have started a provincial database and um, I have to say that we have uh, over 400 names on that list and as everyone from Saskatchewan that's watching this knows that that is nowhere near what the RCMP or police services have um, marked down but these are all valid names um, unfortunately um, that are that are on this provincial database that we have and those were shared through with uh, um, I mean uh, other organizations within Saskatchewan shared their list so we could put it all on one so it was a big call for that Darlene and uh, Okamasum and uh, Myrna Laplante were very um, engaged in in that process and and helped us a lot with that so um, so the other interesting not interesting I shouldn't use that word but the um, other other uh, thing that was noted was that even when the national inquiry was going on that there was still a number of missing or murdered indigenous women and it just seemed uh, a suspicious I guess my words uh, because it seemed to happen every time just before a hearing or just before an expert hearing or an institutional hearing then we would hear that there was a missing or murdered indigenous woman and that kind of freaked us out a bit that um, you know so we'd, we're just wondering just how um, I can't think of the word right now in in terms of, of uh, I guess how deep this goes into in terms of of, of uh, going missing or or being murdered and so NRAC wants to try to get a list complete the list on that and then if they can't get that number then they want to try to get it from the RCMP report up to 2014 because uh, when NRAC was not able to get any more funding, the police from 2010 to 2014, the RCMP, that's when they gave the, the money to the RCMP to do this national database. And they did a report in 2014 and I think stopped and nothing has been done since 2014. And that was also um, a call imperative from, from SOC was in terms of being able to get that actual number because in Saskatchewan, if they say that like overall there's, you know, maybe 90, 95, but we have a list of over 400, that, that just goes to show what kind of numbers it could be in, in other places. So number five, the action was, I'm just checking my time, um, that ANWAC has been looking forward to is to have a missing and murdered indigenous unit or oversight so not only to have an, an independent mechanism to report on the implementation of the national inquiries calls for justice to parliament annually um, also to be able to for NWAC to establish its own internal dedicated MMIWG unit within its national office to work on the calls for justice relating to policy legislation research public education and external liaison work with communities that's public education, not deduction. <laughs> public education, um, police, government, business, and, and lawmakers. And this unit will also provide oversight of the implementation um, of the calls for, for justice. And public education, um, the next slide is that ANRAC is working on a plain language version of the genocide report, and it will be translated into English, French, and Spanish. So Paulina, you'll be able to read it in your own language <laughs> when it comes out. Um, and it's very important too for, for us, like a SOC and, and, and WAC, because we do a lot of our uh, work with um, the Spanish uh, countries in, in terms of the work that we do on, on these issues and what practices work best in terms of providing uh, support and resources uh, to families. And uh, then also for a national awareness campaign to educate Canada's citizens about and to confront and eliminate 
racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. And uh, some of us might remember that um, they did try to do that. The federal government did try to do that when we were initially having the round tables on MMIWG before the actual um, national inquiry came about. And uh, so we hope that that's done and also that Canada will work with NRAC to develop and implement an anti-racism and anti-sexism national action plan to end racism and sexual stere sexualized stereotypes of Indigenous women, girls, to us LGBTQQIA people. And number seven, the next slide, respect political rights and end marginalization. So NRAC signed an accord with the Crown or the Government of Canada on February 1st, 2019. And what that accord was supposed to do in, in, in addition to the first time ever to give core funding to the provincial territorial member associations um, was also to ensure that NRAC was all, uh, at all the decision making tables and that, in, that impact Indigenous women's issues and the rights, including when developing budgets and determining government activities and priorities. And so far it's really been a struggle because they did start and anytime we say the least bit criticism about the government, then they try to shut us out. But then we try to get our foot in the door again. Um, so that, and that's called for justice 1.3. Um, so Indigenous women need to have a voice and have their voice at, at those tables. And then number eight for uh, what we are working on is to uh, get a breast practices summit. And this is to bring together um, people from um, countries across the world um, to a best practices summit to discuss the impact of COVID in their countries and provide practical solutions. And uh, we'd also address the issues that led to missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And uh, a number, if anybody has been to the Organization of American States or to some of the other um, meetings of the Americas um, that are a women from 34 different countries that come together, uh, you really find out a lot of good ways to work and and uh, do things. And so um, even, even though like there's a lot of us that have been working for a long time and me particularly having to ask, you know, why after four, 45 years, well, for me anyway, uh, you know, why do we, why are we still doing this? Indigenous women, Indigenous people and all our allies out there and we're still working on the same issues. Um, you know, from 45 years ago, and so something needs to start changing. So I think with the, um, the National Inquiry and that having done so that the report doesn't sit on the shelf, and I think we've got a lot of really good allies out there. We've got to keep, keep it out. If you notice that there was a letter petition uh, sent out by a number of uh, Indigenous uh, uh, scholars to the Minister Bennett to produce that national action plan. Um, when you see those things, don't be afraid to sign it and put your name to it and, and send it in because that one name really has an impact when it reaches um, the minister or that government office. So then there was also a question in terms of, of uh, some of the policing and, and what can be done in regards to, to that. So, um, so through NWAC, like we've had meetings with the uh, police commissioner, uh, Brenda Lukey, and also like in terms of starting to do some reforms um, with, the, with the RCMP, uh, not only with the RCMP, but also with the uh, city police as well, or police services. And some of them, we probably all heard that all frontline police officers to be equipped with body cameras. Now that has been something that everybody's saying, so they're all saying it from the same mouthpiece. And the, and, uh, the uh, seems like an unspoken protocol to shoot to kill, but those orders be revised so they're less, so that they're nonviolent and uh, 
and also look how they train the officers in terms of de-escalating the situation and how to handle those dangerous situations. Um, and look at the ways that we might be able to turn over some of those duties currently performed by a policeman called to deal with an Indigenous person who is suffering from a mental health issue to social workers, health professionals or elders to hand some of those over. I can tell you that in, in um, uh, Yorkton, what they do too is that SOC has received some calls, um, not when they said somebody's suffering from an Indigenous person suffering from a mental health issue, but when they picked up somebody um, where they have before just recently where they where they, where they picked up um, a man in, in his 50s and then it was obviously he was in distress and a lot of the issues on uh, residential school and stuff so they asked us to come and and talk with him he agreed that he he would like some of our, one of us to come and talk with him so we did we did that and and met with him and he tried to ease the situation a bit and uh, had he not been it, it, it seemed to be that if he had had not had to deal with the uh, the trauma from residential school that he might not have been in the situation where he has, was and, and ended up in that uh, cell for for the night but um, but that was uh, one of the things that he did so um, and then at the end there that we're also asking for a task force to rewrite the relationship between police and Indigenous women with culturally appropriate protocols for safety from street killers, other assailants, and the police themselves. So we're hoping to be able to do that. A lot of it, uh, it's a lot of, lot of work there, but I think for a lot of us, um, we've done some of that work before, and I think that there's also many people out there that, um, uh, you know, through this awareness to the National Inquiry, and the work that other family members have, have done in terms of their walks and their rallies and, and uh, even a mansion to uh, the young people now that are mar walking for walking with our angels, the uh, youth from the uh, Northern communities in terms of, of uh, uh, suicide awareness because there's been so many suicides in, in Northern Saskatchewan and then our Saskatchewan provincial government just voted down a bill to uh, to help uh, uh, people um, in regards to to suicide. So they're doing their walks and and uh, raising that awareness. So everybody is there. They've got maybe a little bit more time during you know there are some good points to a pandemic when some people have uh, you know, kind of rethink what they want to do and, and certainly for Tristan and Miles and everybody that's walking with those young people, um, that they want to make a, a difference, uh, right now too. So just in terms of raising awareness, the next one, uh, I'll just, uh, because people will get the PowerPoint. Um, so raising awareness that ASOC has been doing the faceless dolls every statistic tells a story for the last 10, 15 years. And part of the way that that, that was designed is that it was to give a visual and physical uh, representation of the known cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in, in Canada. And, um, and so now that, that number has gone well over 1,200 and we're, we're never, I don't know if we're ever gonna be, know what the actual number is, Again, but over the years, uh, SOC has facilitated a number of the uh, community workshops for the faceless dolls, uh, creating created by the participants in memory of their loved ones, or uh, school children, or people in our employment programs, or um, just any individual that wants to participate. When I gave a talk at the University of Saskatchewan, the people in the audience were uh, making the dolls as I was doing the presentation. So now that what's happened now since the inquiry took place is that now um, families, and of course when I say families, I don't mean all families because we don't have the reach to all families, but at least within our membership and constituency um, that uh, they've looked at it now since they gave their voice, since they spoke their truth, 
now it's time to give their dolls or their loved ones their a face. And I'll just read it says, their families have given them back their voice. It is now time to put faces on our dolls as a visual symbol of healing and transformation, as a way to honor and acknowledge that the important voices of our women and their families have been healed, heard. Uh, so this is the second phase of um, that ANWAC is doing, and we do have the kits. And what we're saying about it is that putting a face on the doll promotes healing together, relieving heartache and pain in our hearts and souls, and moving forward to seek justice and healing for the families and children of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Now there's a toolkit and accompanying guide that comes with this, and it can be used um, as, as uh, to assist if it's Indigenous women and girls and to us LGBTQQIA people to understand the traditional roles of their ancestors. It can also be used in schools and with community groups uh, in terms of to teach trad traditional values and to help to foster a sense of pride in Indigenous heritage. And just a good learning tool so that, um, you know, people who aren't familiar with the National Inquiry, uh, I still run into people who um, really don't have any understanding um, that there has been a National Inquiry, that there has been a crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women. And sometimes it's easy, easier to, to do it in, in, in setting up a, a workshop for them and, and their team to be able to do that. Now on the next slide, and uh, this close to the very end here, um, as, uh, some of our current initiatives that we're doing. So of course I just mentioned putting a face on Justice Doll Project. We do sit on the Provincial Partnership Committee on Missing Persons. And uh, from that group, we do have uh, family gatherings, which of course we can't have right now. And of course, Missing Persons Week, which is usually in May, has been moved to September and we would be doing some virtual uh, sessions and um, on for Missing Persons Week. And then also right now we're doing a lot of virtual engagement sessions in terms of the pandemic and helping families um, um, with the issues with buying and selling online, with uh, dealing with the children, with preparing the children in terms of online school, uh, whatever issues they got, uh, but we also are doing uh, beading sessions, uh, sewing sessions, uh, whatever topic that the women want to talk about, that's the kind of sessions we'll have. And, and we do uh, help out with, um, like some people don't have the laptops to be able to do WebEx or Zoom, but you can join by teleconference and, and we do have funds to provide um, funds for the phone cards because we know that families don't have with a loss of employment and lack of employment don't have the funds to be able to be on a, a call so we will provide phone cards for people and of course the sisters in spirit uh, uh, october 4th vigils and this year SOC is co-hosting with the rcmp on their third annual feast and round dance that is held by the indigenous police forces in saskatchewan to help build or bridge um, trust relationships. Um, and that will be in November and it's gonna be virtual and in person uh, in a way. And same with the SOC fourth annual MMIWG feast. This is our fourth and uh, final uh, feast that we have December the 5th in Yorkton. We are working on a non-medical protective mask making project which is also a make work project for Indigenous women who lost their employment through COVID or, or their husband or partner lost uh, their employment during COVID. And uh, so we're able to provide that um, employment for them as well as being able to distribute masks all across Saskatchewan, Alberta and, and British Columbia. Uh, so if, uh, and our targets are shelters, correctional systems, and young mothers with families because they seem to get missed out, and long-term care homes, both on and off res reserves of anyone in Saskatchewan that's on there, Alberta or BC, need non-medical protective masks, uh, give us a call. 
uh, we participating on human trafficking research advisory committee so that's very important as part of of uh, work from the national inquiry and and how many people go missing with the uh, human trafficking and if people wonder where the wayfair site came down on it's an online um, online uh, company they were using the names of missing children as a product so that's why they got taken off the internet they can no longer be on the internet that's wayfair w-a-y-f-a-i-r if anybody ordered from there they're no longer there uh, so we have to keep our our guard up all the time and make sure that we're reporting that stuff was the resiliency lodge in saskatchewan and the commemorative project uh, in February that we're working with FSIN, RITSIS, um, all the ones that I talked about from the team leads in the earlier ones, and honoring her Spark Steering Committee with the Aboriginal uh, Friendship Centers of Saskatchewan, and participating in the development of the National Action Plan, which is um, very important that we, we all continue to make some noise about that and participate in any way that we can. I'll go to my next slide to finish off and, and just acknowledgements to everyone that, uh, you know, in order to put this presentation together, there was many, many people that, that shared their wisdom, knowledge, hardships, and truths of me to prepare for this. All the people that, uh, and, and allies and family members, um, you know, that are past met through the community meetings, hearings, statement takings, feasts, vigils, walks, other interactions that happen. And also I give my heartfelt thanks to all the individuals in this field and organizations who, who carry on this work. And I also thank Amnesty International and, and everybody um, that's on this call um, tonight. And just the last slide, which provides our contact information um, there and uh, uh, you can contact us in, in any way like that. And and uh, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone. Miigwech. Thank you so much to both Brenda and Judy for sharing with us. We truly appreciate it. Now, everyone knows how to access the inquiry website and to read the final report and watch more of the videos there. You can also access the resources that Judy shared on the NWAC website and, and look at more of what SOC is doing as well. These are valuable resources for all of us to continue our own learning. In addition, we encourage everyone to visit the Amnesty Canada website. At amnesty.ca, under our work, then campaigns, you will see no more stolen sisters. There are resources such as Amnesty's past research project or past research reports and conversations with grassroots activists who are working to end violence against Indigenous women. And there's more information there on what you can do. All of this work has been informed by the leadership of Indigenous organizations and, most importantly, by family members who are directly affected. So, on behalf of Amnesty Regina, sincere thanks to Dr. Brenda Anderson and Judy Hughes for sharing their wisdom with us, and thank you to all of you from across Canada for being here and learning with us. <laughs>